Anarchitarians, welcome to another edition of Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the internet. I have a returning guest coming in. It's been about three and a half years since I last had him on. He was actually number 11 episode of Anarchast. We're now well into our 200 episodes. And uh, his name is Walter Block. Uh, he's a, a very well-known libertarian. He's actually called Mr. Libertarian. He's been uh, contributing to a body of work on libertarianism and anarcho-capitalism now for decades. Uh, he's, for those who don't know him, he's an American-Austrian school economist and an anarcho-capitalist theorist. And he currently holds the Harold E. Worth Eminent Scholar Endowed Chair in Economics at the J.A. Butt School of Business at Loyola University in New Orleans. And and the reason I wanted to have Walter on uh, again, uh, besides the fact that it's been way too long since we've had him on, is because there's been a lot of uproar about Rand Paul and should anarchists uh, support Rand Paul or even should libertarians support Rand Paul. Uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, discussion and debate going on about that. And I recently had on Judge Andrew Napolitano, who's an anarcho-capitalist, who was essentially saying that he believes that Rand Paul is just like his father. And for that reason, he fully supports him. Uh, but I think there's all sorts of questions we need to ask about this, especially as anarcho-capitalists, in should we ever support any sort of uh, government uh, system or voting or presidents or anything like that? Is there any good reason to do that? And so we're going to get into all that, lots of questions. Uh, so first, uh, uh, Mr. Block, let me ask you, um, you just recently wrote about Rand Paul and, and you said you do support him. Uh, why don't you give us a little bit of the background on, on why you do and, and why, why any sort of libertarian or anarcho-capitalist should or shouldn't support him? Well, uh, I don't know. Uh, to me, it's sort of like falling off a log. Uh, he's the best uh, candidate who with a chance to win. I mean, uh, uh, the Libertarian Party, uh, uh, Gary Johnson, um, is also a pretty good guy from a Libertarian point of view. And if uh, Rand doesn't make it, I would support Gary Johnson. But I think Rand has a better shot uh, in that if he wins the Republican nomination, he's in a major party, uh, the major leagues, if you will, whereas the Libertarian Party is in the minor leagues. And I don't think that uh, there's much of a chance that Gary Johnson will actually win. I think he'll do yeoman work in publicizing and promoting libertarianism, uh, especially if you can get into those debates, which I doubt. But uh, in any case, uh, uh, Rand Paul is uh, way better than any of the other uh, Republican candidates, and I think there are about 20 of them now, and he's head and shoulders above any of them. Uh, I think he's uh, by far the most libertarian uh, senator we now have. And if he wins, uh, again, it's like falling off a log. Uh, let's say Hillary wins the uh, Democratic nomination. Uh, who would you rather have, Rand Paul or Hillary? Well, I mean, you know, that's silly. Uh, it's sort of like denying that two plus two is four almost to, to deny that uh, Rand would be better than uh uh, Hillary, and yet there are people who I respect as libertarians, although I think they're going off the deep end here when they say that these are libertarians with wonderful libertarian credentials saying that they'd support Hillary over uh, Rand. And, you know, I don't know what to say about that. It's just sort of uh, silly, uh, you know, non libertarian. I don't know. Uh, so to me, th there's not much of a. Uh, a question that Rand should be supported. And the only reason I wrote about it. Uh, is because a lot of libertarians are saying either you shouldn't support anyone because you're supporting government or what have you, or, you know, they start saying, well, Rand is not really a great libertarian because he deviated on this and he deviated on that and, and uh, he uh, changed his mind on the third thing and therefore he's no good. Well, yeah, I, I, you know, Rand is not 100% libertarian. Uh, he's uh, not his father. His father I called a 97% a libertarian because I, uh, I'm the 100%. I, I have to look at it uh, from my own uh, you know, eyeglasses. Uh, and I disagree with Ron on well, two or three things. You know, uh, and I disagree with Rand on more. I think Ron is a much better libertarian than his son. I wish the apple would have fallen closer to the tree. But uh, what the heck? Uh, uh, he's he's very good, and and my the reason I wrote about it is because so many libertarians are down on him, and I I think it's unfair and improper, and I, I think Rand is you know pretty darn good, not excellent, but you know uh, B minus or I gave him a seventy on my libertarian meter. I, I might have pulled it down to a sixty, but everybody else is I don't know uh, below thirty, so uh, uh, he's pretty darn good. 
Yeah, it's very interesting to see all the different uh, perspectives on this and all the uproar that this has caused amongst the libertarian and anarcho-capitalist communities. There's some ANCAPs who support Rand. There's some that uh, definitely don't support him, obviously, because of his involvement at all with government. So those, they're the sort of the more extreme, uh, which is fine with me. I have no problem with any sort of anarcho-capitalist or libertarian for the most part, really, as long as they really do want more liberty in our lives. Uh, and uh, But uh, people have really been, there's been all sorts of perspectives as you pointed out, people going off the deep end of people who are, like you said, very well-known libertarians with a good background in libertarianism saying they they hope uh, Hillary wins. Now, actually, I mentioned this, so maybe I can kind of understand their viewpoint. Uh, I was questioning whether uh, it's good if we have a, a libertarian president at this time. And I actually mentioned this back when Ron Paul was running as well. I, I just questioned, will this help our cause or hurt it? Because the U.S. is in such dire straits at the moment. It's going down. The U.S. dollar is going to collapse. The U.S. government is bankrupt. There's no doubt about that. Uh, is there a, a, a risk that, uh, let, I doubt Rand Paul is going to win anyway, because we saw what they did to Ron Paul, but is there a risk that if he did win, that it could actually go against libertarianism because he would be sitting there in the Oval Office as things really started to collapse? Well, of course there's a risk. I mean, you know, you get out of bed, it's a risk. You stay in bed, it's a risk. I mean, life is a risk. You never know for sure what's going to happen, but uh, I think that uh, any realistic assessment of uh, the situation would be that if Rand uh, Paul ran and won not only the Republican nomination, but then beat out Hillary, uh, this would be magnificent. This would be, uh, you know, just fantastic. Uh, because even though Rand never calls himself a libertarian, he calls himself a libertarian conservative or conservative libertarian or libertarian Republican or a constitutionalist libertarian or whatever. He never came out and said, I'm a libertarian, a pure libertarian. Uh, even though uh, he would uh, he would start uh, uh, pulling many troops home, not all troops home, uh, because he believes that, you know, we should get ISIS or something. But uh, right now we have, what is it? Um, I shouldn't say we. Right now the U.S. government has something like a, a thousand military bases in about 150, 160 countries. Well, you know, that's not defense, that's mm -hmm. offense. And I, uh, if Rand sticks to what he is uh, now saying, uh, I don't, uh, Ron would pull all the troops back. If I were president, I would pull all the troops back and have a very strong um, uh, 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 Coast Guard uh, protecting the country, which is what the Constitution says uh, we should do. Uh, Rand will not pull them all, but he'll pull 90% of the troops out or 80% or some significant number. And therefore, uh, the U.S. Uh, will have much less imperialism. In terms of the Fed, uh, he will certainly uh, audit the Fed and um, uh, maybe try to get rid of the Fed after, if the audit doesn't work, whereas Ron was calling for ending it, not auditing it. Uh, so Ron is a little better, but, but who else is calling for even auditing it? Uh, he's going to get rid of all sorts of departments. He's going to reduce uh, uh, foreign aid. He's going to reduce welfare. He's going to reduce crony capitalism. Uh, I don't know that he would favor legalization of all drugs, but he even now says that we should have less penalties for it. Uh, so I, I think uh, uh, he's against a raise in the minimum wage. I wish he would, you know, come out against minimum wage. Period. But uh, at least it wouldn't rise. Whereas you know, under uh, under Hillary, it, it certainly will rise. So I, I can't see how uh, anything could be true other than if he uh, became president, uh, uh, this would be magnificent. Even now, uh, in my article, what I say is, even if he doesn't become president, the fact that he's running means that the L word, the dreaded L word, libertarian, is mentioned. Because they talk about his father, and you can't talk about Ron without mentioning libertarianism. And, and even him, uh, New York Times and the major media are all, all mentioning libertarianism. Whereas when I first got into the libertarian movement, uh, <laughs> it was either left or right, Republican or Democrat, and nobody mentioned liberty or libertarianism. So this is really good. But I, I did want to get in, into one point that you made, if I might, and that is that in voting, you're supporting the state or supporting government. Look, a government is all around us. Uh, you, how did you get to work or uh, school today, uh, average person? You use the road, a street. Well, who owns the roads or the streets? I guarantee you, I'm going to pull out my wallet and, and, and really wow you, that I've got U.S. currency in my wallet. Look, there's a dollar bill. 
Uh, am I supporting the government by using a dollar bill? The other thing. Why don't you flip it around and show the uh, pyramid with the all seeing eye on the other side? Okay. Uh, this will <laughs> That's prove, interesting as well. <laughs> prove that I'm a sellout because I have U.S. currency in my wallet. Uh, I use the roads. I, the other day, I mailed a letter. And guess what? I used the U.S. Post Office. And you know, the government is all around us. Look, uh, let me give you my, my famous or infamous uh, slavery uh, situation or a slavery uh, uh, example. So here, you, here we are, we're all slaves, and the master says, uh, you can vote for overseer goody or overseer baddie. Overseer goody will beat the crap out of you once a week. Overseer baddie will beat the crap out of you once an hour. And we all vote for overseer goody. Uh, because we don't want to beat up once an hour, <clears throat> you know, we want to beat up, not that we want to be beat up once a week, but being <laughs> beat up once a week is better than being beaten up once an hour. So we all vote for overseer goody. Now, this means we support slavery? Uh, only the New York Times would, would say that, uh, you know, uh, or, you know, crazy people would say that. They, we don't support slavery. We just want to be beaten up a little less. Look, I have another confession. When uh, when uh, Obama, my man Obama, was running against McCain, I supported Obama and I wrote about Obama. But I said, why? Because I thought McCain was going to drop a nuclear bomb on people. I, I think he was that crazy. And I don't much like dropping nuclear bombs on people. I think it's, you know, a very bad thing. So I supported Obama. And yet nobody attacked me, uh, that is, within the libertarian movement. Nobody said, well, Block is a sellout. He's not really a libertarian because he supports Obama. I mean, that's crazy. Murray Rothbard, Mr. Libertarian. If anyone is Mr. Libertarian, it's Murray Rothbard. He supported, I forget, was it LBJ or... Um, uh, uh, Goldwater, I, I think it was LBJ against Goldwater for similar reasons, but, but I'm not sure. But Murray was a political hound. He was always supporting this guy or that guy, whether it was governor, mayor, whatever. Why can't we, I mean, it's sort of like football or, or basketball or baseball. <laughs> you know, you root for the home team. I'm now supporting the, um, the New Orleans Pelicans. Uh, they, they're fighting the San Francisco uh, basketball team. I support the, the Pelicans. Uh, does that mean I'm not a libertarian? Does that every Pelican is not a libertarian? I mean, come on. Uh, so this whole idea that, that libertarians shouldn't get involved in politics and, and we shouldn't root for people and we shouldn't support people is crazy. It doesn't violate the non-aggression axiom or the non-aggression principle, which is the essence of libertarianism. So I reject all of this, uh, you know, that we're supporting the government if, if we involve, you know, like some voluntarists say that, and we shouldn't support Rand Paul because Rand is besmirching libertarianism. Well, he is besmirching a little bit, but, you know, compared to everyone else, uh, he's, he's great. Yeah, and I know down below in the comments, uh, there's going to be a lot of what you would call your more extreme anarcho-capitalists. And I'm, again, I, I'm an extreme anarcho-capitalist as well, as, although I, uh, I, I'm I very open to all kinds of ideas on how we can get to liberty, uh, which uh, probably is going to have to go one way or another through government in one way or another, uh, because they're just not going to just disappear overnight just because we're saying smart things out here. Uh, so uh, the, um, uh, the one thing I wanted to ask you was, uh, Judge Napolitano knows Ron and Rand, and uh, he says that he believes that Rand is just as libertarian as his father, but he's just uh, essentially lying, like politicians do, uh, to uh, about certain issues so that he gets uh, more of a vote, so that he can actually get in. So, and uh, Rand Paul also went to the Wailing Wall in Israel, and you don't go there and and do that unless you want to become president, because that's every single person who's ever been president, as far as I know, goes there. They, you have to have the support of whatever interests are over there uh, because they're very uh, obviously very involved in in US uh, politics and government uh, so I'm, I'm I want to ask you this question do you think it's possible that Rand is actually very very uh, libertarian uh, close to 90 hundred percent but he's just uh, massaging it so that he can get elected well this is always a possibility one would hope uh, for that but you know I'm sort of taking him on the basis of what he says I, I met the man once um, oh, let me tell you about how I met him. Uh, this uh, reflects very greatly on me, so I hope you won't mind if I brag a little. Uh, what happened was there was this gigantic libertarian meeting for Ron Paul in um, not Las Vegas. What's the other place in uh, Nevada, the second biggest city? Reno. Reno. And um, uh, there, I don't know, maybe two or 3,000 libertarians. But then what they had was a special thing uh, that 
if you wanted a special session with Ron Paul, you had to pay a thousand bucks and it was limited to maybe a hundred people out of the 3000 or so. And then if you wanted to have a special session with Rand Paul, again, limited to 50 or a hundred people, you had to pay 500. And then if you wanted a special, uh, uh, a uh, session with another person, you had to pay like a hundred bucks, and that third person was me. So it was Ron, Rand, and me, and I was honored that, that they would single me out as uh, the third place person uh, uh, to give a special seminar. Uh, so I, I met him, I shook his hand, but that's all I know about him. I don't know him that well to know whether he's lying or not. Uh, whereas I, I'm not intimate with Ran, with Ron, although I, I have a, you know, a, a bromance with him. I, I love him. I wrote a book about him, uh, uh, which is my love letter to him. Uh, uh, so I, I think I know him a little bit better. I don't know that I know him well enough to know if he's lying, but I, I'd have a better shot. Because I, I, I've had dinner with him. I've met Ron many a time. I've known him for 30, 40 years. Rand, I don't know. So I'm just assuming that Rand is telling the truth, and this is how he feels. <clears throat> and if he's lying and he's really a surreptitious libertarian, well, then even the better. Uh, because then, uh, you know, we'll really have liberty if he, uh, if he gets through. But I'm not assuming that. I'm just assuming he, he's telling the, the God's honest truth as he sees it. And uh, what we see is what we're going to get. And, um, and now, you see, uh, Judge Mahalatano, who I'm also a friend with, um, maybe he knows Rand better. Uh, but you see, just based on, on what Rand is saying, I don't say he's a, you know, a 95 or 97% libertarian. I give him a 60 or a 70 or something. Uh, maybe uh, Judge Napolitano, Andrew, uh, knows better than me. And uh, I just don't go that far. In my writing, I, I even said that I don't go as far as uh, uh, Andrew Napolitano, the judge. Uh, but I do say that, that even as he is, he's really worthy of our respect and our, our support. Yeah, that brings up another question uh, when you mentioned that if he is a real true libertarian and a true libertarian, 100 percent is an anarcho-capitalist. Uh, but, uh, you know, clo clo anything above 90 percent I can get along with fairly well. Uh, but uh, the, the question is, if let's say he is an anarcho-capitalist. He's a true libertarian, a pristine, pure libertarian, and he he sees no rule for government. He does not want any government involvement in his life. He thinks the markets can do a better job of every single thing the government does, which I agree with 100 uh, percent. Let's say he gets in and he's president. How much power does the president really have, though? Because you mentioned if he gets in, then we'll have uh, it'll be libertarian, it'll be liberty again in our lives. Uh, I'm not so sure about that. Uh, what What's your take on if he was president and a, an anarcho-capitalist, uh, how much real liberty or change he could affect? Uh, by the way, let me just say uh, before I answer your question, I'm a professor. I'm never supposed to answer anything directly. I have to go circuitously. Uh, <laughs> even Ron is not an anarchist. Uh, Ron has certain anarcho tendencies, which are great, but uh, he's more of a constitutionalist. Uh, let's get back to uh, 1776 or whatever. Uh, so, Although he did say in one interview that he thinks the idea of anarchy is, I forget the word he used, I think he said great, um, and he said, uh, I think that's wonderful. Uh, so in that sense, because, well, sorry to ask you another question, and maybe we'll get back to the first question first, but I think this is an important question is, uh, what is an anarchist? Because uh, I, I get sort of confused sometimes too, because does it really believe, does it mean that you believe, uh, that the word believe almost becomes religion, right? Uh, that uh, anarchy uh, would be the perfect way for humans to, to organize themselves? Or can you just have that as your uh, sort of your goal or your idea, or your, your move towards that sort of a thing? Well, I mean, most people, when they hear the word anarchy, they go, oh, my goodness, uh, bomb throwing, uh, beard. Well, I have a beard, but I'm not throwing. You have a beard, too. Uh, uh, a little stubble. A little stubble. <laughs> I, I have more anarchist beard than you do. <laughs> uh, most people think of, uh, you know, a crazy person throwing bombs. But if there's anyone throwing bombs, it's not anarchists. It's archists. Uh, so what does anarchy mean? Uh, the prefix an means against. So anarchists are against archy. And I define archy as unjustified rule. So we're against unjustified rule. Look, uh, you know, people say, uh, I mean, taxes. Uh, the government uh, requires taxes. Just April 15th uh, passed uh, a few days ago, and uh, everybody's got a pony up. And uh, the anarchists say, look, uh, this is theft. Uh, taxes are theft. And the opposition says, no, 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 it's not t uh, taxes. It's sort of like you're in the U.S. club or the Canada club. <laughs> 
not Canada Club booze, but you know, <laughs> Canadian Club uh, or the Canadian group. But none of us have agreed to be part of the, the group. I mean, uh, if you join the golf club or the tennis club or the chess club, you have to pay dues. And these people say, well, taxes are just like dues. But when you join the golf club or the tennis club or the condominium association and you agree to be paying dues to them for garbage collection or whatever, you've agreed. You signed a contract. We never signed a con I never joined the U.S. government. I mean, when the U.S. government started, uh, it was nine out of 13 colonies, which was not unanimous. And even in the nine colonies, it was only a majority. It wasn't unanimous. Whereas in the free enterprise system, everything is unanimous. You uh, have a coat, a, a lovely uh, jacket, uh, and you paid, I don't know, 100 bucks for it to just pick a number out of the hat. You valued it at more than 100, otherwise you wouldn't have bought it. And the guy who sold it to you valued it less than 100, otherwise he wouldn't have sold it to you. So you had mutual gain and there was unanimous consent. And and this buying of the jacket on your part is uh, sort of emblematic of what the free enterprise system is. And that's all the free enterprise system consists of. Uh, we're not in the crony capitalism. We're in a laissez-faire capitalism. So there's unanimity all throughout, but there's no unanimity in the government. So uh, we anarchists are not against, uh, we're not in favor of bomb throwing or violence. We're, we're against it. And we're saying that the government is doing it per se and necessarily because they always tax. Now, let me give you another uh, uh, defense of, of uh, anarchism, and that is there is anarchism right now between the countries of the world. There's anarchism between Argentina and Arabia. There's uh, anarchism between Burundi and Brazil. There's anarchism, and notice my alliteration, now I'm up to the seas, between Canada and Chile. Uh, there's anarchy between Denmark and some other country, beginning with D, but I can't think of one. There's anarchy between countries, and the only way to get rid of anarchy between countries is to have, wait for it, world government. But nobody wants world government, so we're all anarchists now. You know, the, what do they say? We're all Keynesians now. And, you know, <laughs> we're all anarchists now, unless we want world government, which some people do, but sensible people don't want it. Look, I'm Jewish. Uh, we Jews are always running away from somebody, <laughs> running out of this country, go to some other country. These people are picking on you. You run somewhere else. Um, if there were world government, there'd be no place to run. So, you know, uh, anarchy is not a, an evil word. It's just a, a prefix A-N against archy, and archy is unjustified rule. And if you're really against anarchy, you have to favor world government. Virtually no one favors world government except a bunch of hippie lefties. And uh, so we're all anarchists, or virtually all anarchists. So you people who are against anarchy, embrace your inner anarchism. <laughs> we're all anarchists now. Uh, now let me get back to your other question about power. How much power would the president have? If uh, Rand Paul became president, uh, uh, would he have some power? Well, you know, uh, what's his name? Uh, Obama says he's got, what is it, a pencil and a telephone or something, and he's going to uh, do initiatory things. Well, I don't think Rand would do that. Because Rand, I think, respects the Constitution more, and in the Constitution, the president is supposed to uh, isn't supposed to be a dictator like Obama. Although I still favor my man Obama, I've got my man Obama's back. Uh, it's uh, Obama against uh, McCain because he's sort of a reluctant warrior, and he hasn't dropped a nuclear bomb on anyone. So, uh, what a guy! I'm, I'm he's he's the, winning that Nobel Peace Prize for sure again. Well, he's a Nobel Peace Prize, so he can't throw throw the bomb, uh, the atom bomb, or the nuclear bomb. Uh, so I, I'm I'm an Obama fan still. Uh, Obama fan in the context of, of McCain, but obviously not against uh, anybody uh, a little bit better than him. And, you know, on economics, he's horrible, but McCain wasn't uh, that great on economics either. Uh, but getting back to the question of how much power would the president have? Well, I think the president would have a lot of power, especially in foreign policy. Because he could pull troops back and make a very strong Coast Guard and uh, maybe have one or two countries where we're bombing or something. I don't know. Uh, that is Rand Paul. Ron uh, has said he would get rid of them all. Uh, I think that the president, look, if Rand won, he would have coattails. Then members of Congress would say, well, you know, uh, we're now in Libertopia or <laughs> Libertarian land. So when Rand uh, uh, now puts forth something to get rid of, I don't know, the Department of Commerce or the Department of Education or, or get rid of the Fed, he's going to have a much better chance than uh, if Hillary were president. So, you know, uh, I, I agree with you that the president is not all powerful, except when Obama is taking uh, extra constitutional uh, powers, but he's still pretty powerful, especially over foreign policy. And foreign policy is um, more important than economic policy and personal liberties because 
uh, uh, foreign policy sort of determines economic policy. The reason we have a, uh, and Bob Higgs, a friend of mine, a historian, has shown over, and Tom Woods uh, over and over again, and Murray Rothbard, that the, uh, the reason we have a lot of uh, economic uh, uh, interventionism, it, it stems from war. To get ready for World War One, World War Two, this war, that war, and every time we get a war, we sort of ratchet up government, <clears throat> and then after the war goes, uh, we don't really get much further. We we just sort of increase government. So, foreign policy is very important. The president has a lot of power in foreign policy. So I I think that. It would be really worthwhile uh, getting off our rear ends and supporting him. Now, look, a lot of people say, well, you, you know, uh, there are other ways of promoting liberty than politics. And I agree with that. I mean, politics is just one way. Murray Rothbard used to say that every four years or every two years, people who ordinarily are interested in uh, playing golf or bowling or playing chess or whatever it is, and they're not really interested in politics, but every two or four years they focus on it. So why shouldn't we try to get some small part of that megaphone? But there are other ways to promote liberty. I I, I once ran for office. I, I ran as uh, for a New York State Assemblyman in 1969, and then I once tried to become the uh, president or vice president for the Libertarian Party, but I didn't make that. Uh, but I'm so I, I support the Libertarian Party and I support uh, Ron Paul. I wrote a book uh, in favor of him. I give uh, a lot of lectures to uh, annual state conventions of the Libertarian Party. I'm active in the Libertarian Party in Canada. I've given a lot of lectures there. But there are other ways. Uh, the Free State Project in New Hampshire, get all the libertarians go to New Hampshire. Seasteading is a good way uh, of, of promoting liberty. Um, uh, the Mises Institute, which is my favorite uh, think tank, is a way of promoting liberty. My own way of promoting liberty is uh, I'm a professor. I write books. I write articles. I give interviews like I'm now giving. And a lot of my students are now professors and are converting other, their students to libertarianism and Austrian economics. So there are many, many ways toward liberty. Politics is one of them. Uh, it, it's a good one. It's not the only one. Uh, it's not one that I specialize, specialize in. I specialize in uh, more academia. But um, so uh, to answer, just to summarize the thing about power, no, the president isn't all powerful. He's not like the prime minister who's got more power in Canada than the president in the United States, but he's still got plenty of power and it's worthwhile fighting for Rand Paul. Yeah, very interesting. And um, I think one thing that's sort of not been mentioned too much is uh, that there's a real libertarian movement going on. And you've been in this movement, which you could almost say you're at the beginning, uh, back with Murray Rothbard, uh, which really, in my opinion, was the beginning of this sort of philosophy ideology and beginning to spread. And Murray Rothbard actually said, I watched a speech of his recently where he was saying how he became an anarchist. And he said, back in the old days, there was literally six, six anarchists. <laughs> and we'd be sitting in a room and we joke about how maybe one day somebody might uh, know our name or something. Uh, and this is really taken off. And then, of course, Ron Paul was the biggest next movement uh, to really move that forward. Uh, he, in my opinion, has created more libertarians than anyone alive today, in my opinion. I could be wrong, but that's my opinion. And, uh, of course, as you know, once you're a, a small uh, L libertarian, uh, it's not too long before you start to say, well, well yeah, why don't we, if we cut 97% of it and it's way better, let's cut the other 3% and, and see what happens. Uh, but uh, I wanted to mention two things that, that your point uh, uh, brought up. One is this thing called the Dallas Accord of the Libertarian Party, because there was a fight within the Libertarian Party between the anarchists and the minarchists, uh, minimal government archists who believe in limited government, armies, courts, and police, and that's it. And the Dallas Accord was, well, let's let's not fight. Let's first get government down to, uh, you know, 3% of what it is, and then we'll fight over with whether we should go to the other 3%. So I, I don't usually debate too much about anarchists versus minarchism. You know, I'm a big tent kind of guy. I even include uh, uh, Milton Friedman and Hayek as libertarians, even though they're really classical liberals. Uh, so that that's, um, uh, I think, uh, one point that uh, I, I wanted to uh, mention about, you know, th this uh, debate. Uh, the second point is, uh, who who is uh, responsible for converting masses of people to libertarianism? And I think Ron Paul is one of the two chief people. The other is Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand uh, wrote this book in 1957, I think, Atlas Shrugged, which book converted me to libertarianism, along with Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson. 
and uh, she's not alive now, but I, I think there are two people that stand way over and above anyone else uh, in terms of converting masses of people. Her book, Atlas Shrugged, is still selling like 100,000 copies a year, and, and it came out in 57, and, and you know, what is it? It's over 50 years, 60 years later. Uh, so she and uh, Ron, now she never called herself a libertarian, she called herself an objectivist, but uh, and she dismissed libertarians as hippies of the right. Uh, there was some sort of product differentiation thing going on. But in, in terms of her uh, policies on economic, see, she uh, insisted that in, in addition to libertarianism, you have to have views on metaphysics and epistemology and aesthetics and all sorts of other things. But, you know, and I, I was part of that movement on the periphery for a while, but I, I never really got into that other stuff. To me, the only thing that was really important was the political philosophy of laissez-faire capitalism. So uh, she and Ron, uh, I think, uh, are the two most responsible for a mass of, of libertarians. Uh, I, when I first met Murray, I asked them not how many anarchists there were, but how many libertarians there were in the world. And this was in 1966. And he said about 25. Uh, so maybe there were six anarchists and 25 others. And, you know, we've come a long way, baby. You know, the gays say we are everywhere. Well, we are everywhere also. And it's interesting that the two, Ron, uh, now, Murray Rothbard and, and Hayek and Friedman and Mises, uh, I think, were more intellectuals. Uh, whereas Ron and um, Ayn Rand were not so much intellectuals as they were more popularizers, although they, they were also intellectuals. They made intellectual contributions, but their um, uh, uh, conversion of masses of people was not the intellectuals, whereas Mises and Hayek and Rothbard uh, had a narrower following. But uh, based on Hayek's second ideas or uh, secondhand dealers in ideas, uh, Mises and Rothbard uh, converted people like you and I, perhaps. And then we went out and, you know, me in academia and you uh, uh, with your uh, radio show and, and many others uh, uh, promoted liberty peripherally. But it was Ayn Rand and Ron Paul, I think, who get the credit for the most conversions. And yet their personalities were very different. You know, sometimes... The question is, well, what's the best way of converting people to libertarianism? And my answer is, as an Austrian subjectivist, there's no one best way. We each have to convert people in our own way. And there are some people that would like the Ayn Rand way, which is sort of taking a fish and smacking you in the head with it. <laughs> if I could, you know, she was really in your face and very <laughs> magnificent. And Ron Paul is much, uh, much less aggressive, much less assertive, much more laid back, but equally uh, 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 successful in converting people to libertarianism. So I say there's no one right way to do it. Uh, you know, this audience might need something, that audience might need a different way. Not that you should change the idea, but maybe pre change the presentation, change the topics. So if you're talking to the left wingers, maybe talk about legalizing marijuana. If you're talking to right wingers, maybe talk about legalizing gold more but not deny the other. In other words, don't go to the left-wing group and deny that you favor gold and don't go to the right-wing group and deny that you favor legalizing drugs, but maybe emphasize it more or, or something like that. And, and with the right-wing group say that, look, we want to legalize prostitution. It doesn't mean we favor prostitution. It just means we favor the legalization, which is a, a very different kind of a thing. Or with pot, uh, marijuana, we don't favor the use of it. We just uh, oppose putting people in jail for doing things that many of us think you, know, you shouldn't do, like recreational marijuana yeah um i think uh you, you've pretty much convinced me here uh, i'm sort of that anarchists should uh support Rand paul uh the and but you know as far as going out and, and voting what well, we all know that voting is pretty for one person it's it's uh, useless and a waste of time because unless the, the vote was decided by one vote you made absolutely no difference however i think in this case um in some ways maybe you can because even if uh Let's say it comes to Rand Paul and Hillary Clinton and her vice president Michelle Obama, and uh, you know the, <laughs> Satan itself uh, running for president, and um, and uh, and say it's Rand Paul on the other side, and uh, Rand Paul loses by a few percent. Uh, that still shows, in some ways, especially if he's been really pushing a lot of the libertarian stuff, that people are going to go, "Whoa, this libertarian sort of style is, you know, it shows in the numbers that it's it's got a uh, a, uh, a interest in, in the public." So, in that respect. It might make sense. Well, I think that Rand Paul will have the biggest hurdle of getting the Republican nomination. Uh, and he might not make it, but I hope he does. But I think if he gets it, I think he'll beat Hillary. Because he can out-left her 
<laughs> on foreign policy. She is a, a warmonger. She is a, a, a neocon type. Uh, she is going to lose the people that like um, uh, Elizabeth Warren, uh, uh, who are more, or Bernie Sanders, who are more uh, lefty on foreign policy. And uh, she uh, doesn't favor legalizing drugs as much as Ron does or reducing the penalties for, for that. So I think, I think that uh, uh, Rand can peel off uh, traditionally uh, Democratic votes, uh, the black vote, the African-Americans. I think he's got a much better shot at getting that vote than any other Republican uh, candidate. I think he's got a much better shot with the Jewish vote. Uh, look at what happened with Obama, with, uh, with Israel and Netanyahu. Uh, so I think uh, with the young people. Uh, so I think if he just gets it, he'll beat Hillary. I think he might not get it, but if he gets it, I think he'll beat Hillary, although, you know, I've been proven wrong before in these assessments, but, you know, I hope it. But I think you're right. Even if he doesn't beat her, even if he doesn't win, if he gets, so oh, 47 percent, she gets 53 percent, libertarianism uh, will be on everyone's lips. People will now read um, Hayek or Mises or, or Rothbard in a way that they wouldn't be uh, before because they would say, well, you know, what is this libertarianism? And uh, I think maybe in the next election in 2020, uh, maybe Rand would beat her uh, then uh, if he loses in 2016. Yeah, so I, I think, yeah, it definitely makes sense. I even, uh, I, I know you were up there with uh, Tim Moan, the leader of the Libertarian Party of Canada, uh, who's an anarcho-capitalist. Uh, and uh, and uh, actually every single uh, leader of the Libertarian Party of Canada that I know, uh, uh, Sieg Pede, who started it, uh, Katie Chan, who was the last one, and now Tim Moan, they're all anarchists. Uh, so uh, I even uh, joked with them. I even sent an email out to a few of my Canadian, because I'm from Canada, friends, and uh uh, who are quite well known, like James Corbett and Dan Dix and Stefan Molyneux. I said, why don't we all just run for this upcoming Canadian election? And uh, they all were actually very against it. They said, I don't want anything to do with it. It's like, no, this, you know, what if four anarchists get elected? Because we all have a big audience. Uh, you know, so, the people I mentioned, James Corbett's got a huge audience uh, and um, totally possible. And all of us, obviously, we're all in media, so we can all talk. We can all, you know, do the walk sort of thing. And then people might listen to us. Um, and and uh, but they were all against it. And so it's sort of funny. I'm an anarchist. It's sort of funny. All these things we have to do as anarchists to bring about anarchy. Uh, you have to actually play these games and and get involved in things you would never want to get involved in. Uh, but it's uh, it's also interesting, too, because as anarchists, what we want is more government. We want seven billion governments. So you brought up the point earlier about how it's always better to have more states. Uh, one world government is the worst case scenario for not only anarchists, but human human beings. <laughs> in general and the planet also uh, but uh, you know so if we can get that in the u.s i don't know why this never gets brought up it seems obvious to me because the u.s was started as separate states and then they just you know after the fascist abraham lincoln took over uh they became like this one big state and they took over everything which is what fascism and all that's all about uh but uh why is you know that that should be something that should be talked about more i would think is why don't we just go back to 50 separate states and and let them have sovereignty over themselves uh because there's so many, you know, you talk to anyone in most states and they're like, oh, I hate those other people from these other states because they're always doing different things that I don't do or like. And um, uh, so, yeah, separate. Uh, so then there's, of course, been a fairly big separation movement happening, uh, you know, in different pockets all over the world, including Venice, Italy, who wanted to separate and all kinds of places, of course. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's really, really interesting time. So uh, this interview is getting a little long and you're, I'm sure, busy there. Um, so if you want to respond to that and make any final comments and also let people know where they can get more information on you and your books and everything else. Okay, great. The, the problem with you as an interviewer, if I may say so, is that you are so fascinating and you have so many ideas. Like in the last time you raised like five points that I want to respond to. This is well, just if you have time, go ahead and yes, respond. Well, I'm gonna, I, I sort of promised you an hour and we've got another 15 minutes. So let me reply to the sure. five points that you just made uh, or six. Uh, first of all, in Canada, I have uh, roots in Canada. I work for the Fraser Institute in, uh, in Vancouver. Well, now it's spreading around. Uh, but when I was there, it was just in Vancouver. I worked there from 1979 to 1991. And I did a, oh, 10 different books and many, many articles. So I'm a little bit more familiar with the Canadian situation than many American uh, people such as I am. I'm also a Canadian citizen, a dual citizen. And um, 
Uh, I am sort of a buddy of Tim Moen. Uh, he and I have been on several programs together. And I wanted to uh, mention advice that I gave to him. Uh, what he asked was, uh, well, what about abortion? How should he respond to abortion? And what I said to him, and I'll say it now, and, and I'll say it to these four or five people that you were suggesting that run for office because I'm, I'm supporting you on this. I'm going to try to uh, get them to run for office on the Libertarian Party ticket as well. And what I said to him is, say something like, look, the general public is very, very um, unsure or all over the lot on abortion. Uh, there's pro-life, there's pro-choice. Uh, people uh, in the general public are, are very uh, unsure philosophically about this. The pro-choice is uh, in the ascendancy, but pro, there's a lot of pro-life sentiment in both countries. And it's the same thing in the libertarian movement. Uh, you have Ron Paul, who is a staunch pro-lifer, if anyone is a staunch pro-lifer. And you have Murray Rothbard, who is another libertarian with great libertarian credentials, who is a, a staunch pro-choicer. So we uh, diverge on this, and therefore the Libertarian Party has no position on this. And I am now, Tim Moen, I'm now on stage, I'm representing the Libertarian Party. So all I can say is that we're unsure about this, just like the general public. However, if you want to see me afterward, uh, I'll give you my own views. And Tim Moen is a pro-life, so he can give his own views. Or even on stage, you can say, you know, I personally believe in, in pro-life. So that's one way uh, for Libertarian office holders to uh, run and be true to their own principles and say, look, my own personal view is X, Y, Z. But the Libertarian Party uh, has no position on this because we're as uh, uh, divided on this as, uh, as the general public. Okay, second point. Uh, you're right. You mentioned uh, four or five uh, uh, high. Pro uh, Wendy McElroy is another uh, libertarian in Canada. Karen Selleck, uh, uh, a whole bunch of people who write for the National Post. Redmond Weisenberger as well. Red um, why don't we all just run? We, I That's, think we still got time. Right. I think this would be <laughs> magnificent if if uh, if how many writings are in Canada? Ninety nine or something like that. It would be ideal if every writing had a libertarian candidate. Uh, and, and there are high-profile uh, libertarians. Uh, uh, four or five people who write for the National Post are pretty good libertarians. Uh, Karen Selleck, Wendy McElroy, yourself, um, uh, Tim Moen, who is obviously running. Vic Pross is another one, an artist, a, a libertarian. Uh, 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 um, uh, uh, Paul Stephen Geddes, Molyneux. Stephen Molyneux, Paul Geddes, a whole bunch of libertarians. Uh, 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 and um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Grubel was once a, um, uh, uh, a a member of parliament, Herb Grubel. He's not really a libertarian. He's more conservative, but he's sort of libertarian-ish. And then there's uh, the Prince of Pot, um, Mark Emery. I don't know if he's eligible to run, but his wife is. And uh, uh, she uh, would be a very attractive candidate. So if you got 15 people like that, high-profile libertarians, you can make a big splash for, for liberty. Okay, you're not going to win. Big deal. But you can bash away at the other three parties. You know, the, uh, the NDP at one time talked about legalizing marijuana, but then they got off of it. And, and uh, Justin uh, Trudeau was talking about legalizing marijuana. You could support him on that. Uh, so I think that would be a magnificent idea. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is Abe Lincoln and secession. We, we, I mean, you, you only spoke for two minutes, and yet, you know, <laughs> uh, first about Abe Lincoln. Everybody in the U.S. and Canada thinks of St. Abe. Uh, Abe Lincoln is magnificent. Abe Lincoln is wonderful. My friend Tom DiLorenzo has done several books uh, on, on Abe Lincoln, uh, Dishonest Abe, he calls him. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to have him on in the next uh, few weeks. We're connected right now, so I've never had him on oh, Anarchist, so I'm excited. He's magnificent. And one of the quotes that Tom brutes about uh, that comes from Lincoln was the following. This will be a paraphrase, maybe not the exact words, but this is what Lincoln said. He, Lincoln said, is, look, I don't give a, a rat's rear end about slavery. Lincoln never spoke that way, but <laughs> I'll put it in modern parlance. I don't care about slavery. I care about secession and keeping the, the country together. If slavery will keep the country together, I'll support slavery. If slavery will uh, undermine the country, I'll uh, oppose slavery. I don't care about slavery. I care about keeping the country together. That's my goal. So, you know, this is not so saintly. I mean, you know, because he's got the reputation of favoring, uh, you know, ending slavery. But he wasn't an opponent of slavery. Uh, the abolitionists were opponent of slavery, but not Abe Lincoln. Okay, now the second point, there was no civil war in uh, the United States in 1861. 
because a civil war means that each party wants to run the whole country. There was a Spanish civil war in 36 because the fascists and the communists each wanted to run all of Spain. There was a civil war in Russia in 1917 because the Red Army and the White Army each wanted to run the whole country. But in, in 1861, there wasn't a civil war because while the North wanted to run North and South, the South didn't want to run North and South. The South just wanted to secede. Well, so the, the correct uh, uh, appellation or the correct way to refer to the so-called civil war is a war of secession or a war to prevent secession or a war of northern aggression because it wasn't over slavery, uh, although I mean, there was slavery in the north too. Uh, the, 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 by the way, the first secession movement uh, was in 1825. Massachusetts wanted to leave the uh, United States because there were a lot of abolitionists there and they, they said the United States supports slavery and we want out. So, uh, you know, people say, well, if you support the South, you support secession, you support slavery, you're anti-black or something. The obvious rejoinder to that is Massachusetts. Uh, they weren't, uh, they were opposing slavery and they wanted secession. So secession is very different. And now you mention all these places like Scotland, which unfortunately failed, but there's this place in Italy, a place in Spain, uh, 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 New Hampshire is thinking of seceding from the country with all those libertarians on the Free State Project. And then there are, you know, like, people in California want to secede from California. And, and you're quite right. We, want, we love government so much that we want 7 billion of them. Namely, secession is, is the key because another aspect of, um, of libertarianism is free association. You should not be compelled to associate with people you don't want to associate with. The only problem with rape is that the rape victim is forced to associate with the, uh, the rapist. The only problem with slavery is that the slave is forced to associate with the slave master when he really doesn't want to. And, uh, you know, uh, the Civil Rights Act of uh, 64, I think it was, or 65, 63, somewhere in there, uh, when Woolworths was forced to um, – uh, serve black people that they didn't want to serve. Free association was also abridged, and therefore there was a little bit of slavery. Now, libertarians, you know, nowadays there's this big uh, thing in the United States that uh, a gay couple will go to, see how, how you get me going? You, you just said three <laughs> words, and I'm just babbling. Uh, there was this uh, photographer or the baker or a florist, uh, and a gay couple went to them and said, hey, we want you to uh, help us out at our wedding. And they said, you know, sorry, uh, we don't want to because, you know, our religious views don't allow us to support weddings. But, you know, if you want to buy a cake or a pizza here, you know, We'll sell it to you. The libertarians go further. The libertarians say, you know, we should have free association, period. And if you don't want to serve uh, blacks or greens or blues or left-handed, red-headed people, you shouldn't be forced to. So uh, libertarians take a, a very radical uh, point uh, on that. And uh, thanks to Thomas Sowell and Walter Williams and others in labor economics who have shown that if you discriminate against groups, uh, it, it's impotent to really hurt them. And that the real discrimination is a thing like the minimum wage law, which unemploys black people, or uh, drugs, which put black people in jail at, at highly disproportionate rates. Uh, the Thomas Sowell and Walter Williams make the point that if you discriminate against, say, blacks, and you won't hire them, their salary goes down, their wages go down, because the demand curve shifts to the left, to put it in economic <clears throat> parlance. <clears throat> but if so, and the black productivity is the same, then you'll make more money if you hire a black at these below wage uh, levels, and now you'll unemploy all the bigots. So this is a, a little bit of bringing in economics uh, to the analysis and also... Yeah, I've, I've also, I have a, a, when I talk about that, about how uh, if someone wants to, they have a business and they want to turn away a certain people, fine, the, that business is now less successful. So its competitors will have an advance, advantage on them. And I always use this as a uh, example. If an MBA owner hates black people, he doesn't want any black people on his team, that's fine. They'll, they'll come in last every year and he'll go out of business. He only hurts himself. Precisely. And, and I think Thomas Sowell and Walter Williams, by the way, who are both black, and, and since the, the view of the uh, major media is that all blacks have to be socialists, and these guys aren't uh, socialists, the understatement of the year, therefore they're Oreo cookies, they're really not authentic blacks, they're, you know, they're black on the outside, but they're really white on the inside, which is you know, crazy. Well, it's almost <laughs> at the end of the hour and I promised you an hour. So let me just say in conclusion, um, if you're interested in my work, uh, walterblock.com or email me at wblock, W-B-L-O-C-K, 
at loino.edu, Lewis Oliver Yellow, New Orleans, L-O-Y-N-O dot E-D-U for education. And uh, we can uh, be in touch. And thanks for having me on your program. And don't make it four years till the next time. <laughs> so I very much enjoy uh, interacting with you. Yeah, you as well. And we'll definitely make sure it's less than four years in the future. And it might be even sooner if we follow through on this uh, grand idea that we just spontaneously came up with that all of us should run for government in Canada, including yourself. I don't know. I've been looking into this because I don't live in Canada and you're obviously in the U.S. I don't know if you have to actually be resident just to run. Um, so I could just do it on the Internet, all my speeches and debates. Uh, and uh, basically all my answers will be they'll ask me, what's your position on this? What's your position on that? And I'll tell them, you don't even have to ask me. Just ask yourself, is there a victim or not? If there's a victim, I'm against it. If there, not, if there is no victim, I'm totally for it. Or not totally for it, but I, I'm fine with it. <laughs> for, the legal, uh, for the legalization of it. Yeah, for decriminalization. Right. Uh, so, uh, you know, we could do so many interesting things, you know. Can you imagine if, if we did this? And uh, let's talk to Tim about it. Tim Moan, the leader of the Libertarian Party of Canada. Uh, I'm all for it. I think it'd be fun. Uh, James Corbett, again, a big guy. Um, Dan Dix, big name in Canada for Press for Truth. Uh, Redmond Weisenberger, the uh, Mises Canada uh, founder. Uh, Wendy McElroy, one of the icons in the Libertarian movement. Uh, and there's more and more, as you pointed out. We could almost have like a big name person as far as you know in the libertarian sort of circles uh in in the running and in, in many writings in canada that would create a huge amount of press by the way speaking of mises canada and redmond uh, uh weissenberger there is a mises university that will take place in toronto in uh july and uh young students particularly but anyone i think is invited so uh uh, uh get in touch with you or me if you're interested in it's a three-day seminar not so much on libertarianism but more on austrian economics which is the free enterprise economics so people might be interested in that yeah and i think that's free Yes, uh, if I, uh, yeah, there are so. scholarships, thanks to uh, funders. And also, I'm a big fan of the Mises Institute in uh, the U.S., and uh, they are having a uh, seminar in uh, July also, uh, a whole week, and it's also free, uh, free scholarship. So if you're interested in that, uh, Google Mises Institute in uh, the U.S. or uh, a Ro um, a Mises uh, Rothbard Institute, no, Mises, uh, Mises Institute in Canada or Mises Institute in the U.S., yeah, lots of great things to check out if you don't know them. Uh, so yeah, you might be hearing more about uh, this uh, idea we just had, uh, which I think is a great idea. And uh, so we'll see what happens. That'd be pretty, uh, I think it would go amazing. I think uh, as well, it just, I know we only have like two minutes left, but uh, the Canadians in general are kind of funny with politics. I don't know if you ever noticed this. People like Rob Ford, uh, who many people probably know. A lot of Canadians just love him. Uh, there was uh, Jean Chrétien. He once, once punched up protester in the face and a lot of people thought that was great uh and then there's pierre trudeau before that this drinker guy he was always giving the finger to the media people like him so th they're not so much like in the u.s where if you want to become president you have to exactly look and act this certain way and you can't have any sort of personality outside of you can tell a few jokes or you have no real character about you you're just this this person who reads off the teleprompter but in canada they're more open to that so it could be interesting yeah there was a rhino party for a while I don't think they're around, uh, but you don't have to be a mucho serioso. Uh, we can have fun. Uh, uh, I would be happy to do it, but I think you have to be a resident, not just a citizen. I'm a citizen of, the, of Canada, but not a resident. I'm a resident of the U.S., so I can't do it, but I certainly will root this on, and, and I'm glad that the two of us uh, concocted this while we're, we're talking here. And I think Tim Moen should invite all these people that we've mentioned and others, a high-profile libertarians, and, and get them to run for the LP. Yeah, I actually looked into it. I Richard Heathen, a past Anacast guest, I believe you know him as well. He did the Rise of Collectivism movie, which was awesome. It just came out. Uh, we'll put a link to that down below if you want to check it out. And uh, <clears throat> he's also Canadian. Uh, and uh, so he was the one who sort of first brought it up to me. Uh, or I might have brought it up, but then he said, you know, I think you can do this. And I said, well, can you, I don't have time, but can you look into it or someone look into it if you have to be resident or not? If not, then I'll do it. But I'm not going to become a resident of Canada uh, for tax reasons uh, <laughs> to uh, just 
this to do this. Uh, but uh, I, you know, if I can do it, I'll do it. So that's great. Thank you so much, Walter Block. Uh, check out all the stuff that he mentioned. Uh, if you don't know him, uh, one of my favorites is he wrote a book about the privatization of the roads uh, and how it w should be done or would be done or how it would be m so much better. And uh, that's a question a lot of us libertarians always get is the roads, you know. So uh, that he, he's the one who's really answered that question. So check that out. We'll put a link to that down below. Lots of links, lots of stuff for you to check out. And also like, subscribe, share to these videos. That's how you can spread this message. And it is growing. Uh, so this is Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the Internet. Peace, love, and anarchy. To another edition of Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the internet. I have a returning guest coming in. It's been oh, about three and a half years since I last had him on. He was actually number 11 episode of Anarchast. We're now well into our 200 episodes. And uh, his name is Walter Block. Uh, he's a, a very well-known libertarian. He's actually called Mr. Libertarian. He's been uh, contributing to a body of work on libertarianism and anarcho-capitalism now for decades. Uh, he's, for those who don't know him, he's an American-Austrian school economist and an anarcho-capitalist theorist. And he currently holds the Harold E. Worth Eminent Scholar Endowed Chair in Economics at the J.A. Butt School of Business at Loyola University in New Orleans. And and the reason I wanted to have Walter on uh, again, uh, besides the fact that it's been way too long since we've had him on, is because there's been a lot of uproar about Rand Paul and should anarchists uh, support Rand Paul or even should libertarians support Rand Paul. Uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, discussion and debate going on about that. And I recently had on Judge Andrew Napolitano, who's an anarcho-capitalist, who was essentially saying that he believes that Rand Paul is just like his father. And for that reason, he fully supports him. Uh, but I think there's all sorts of questions we need to ask about this, especially as anarcho-capitalists, in should we ever support any sort of uh, government uh, system or voting or presidents or anything like that? Is there any good reason to do that? And so we're going to get into all that, lots of questions. Uh, so first, uh, uh, Mr. Block, let me ask you, um, you just recently wrote about Rand Paul and, and you said you do support him. Uh, why don't you give us a little bit of the background on, on why you do and, and why, why any sort of libertarian or anarcho-capitalist should or shouldn't support him? Well, uh, I don't know. Uh, to me, it's sort of like falling off a log. Uh, he's the best uh, candidate uh, who with a chance to win. I mean, uh, uh, the Libertarian Party, uh, uh, Gary Johnson, um, is also a pretty good guy from a Libertarian point of view. And if uh, Rand doesn't make it, I would support Gary Johnson. But I think Rand has a better shot uh, in that if he wins the Republican nomination, he's in a major party, uh, the major leagues, if you will, whereas the Libertarian Party is in the minor leagues. And I don't think that uh, there's much of a chance that Gary Johnson will actually win. I think he'll do yeoman work in publicizing and promoting libertarianism, uh, especially if you can get into those debates, which I doubt. But uh, in any case, uh, uh, Rand Paul is uh, way better than any of the other uh, Republican candidates, and I think there are about 20 of them now, and he's head and shoulders above any of them. Uh, I think he's uh, by far the most libertarian uh, senator we now have. And if he wins, uh, again, it's like falling off a log. Uh, let's say Hillary wins the uh, Democratic nomination. Uh, who would you rather have, Rand Paul or Hillary? Well, I mean, you know, that's silly. Uh, it's sort of like denying that two plus two is four almost to, to deny that uh, Rand would be better than uh uh, Hillary, and yet there are people who I respect as libertarians, although I think they're going off the deep end here when they say that these are libertarians with wonderful libertarian credentials saying that they'd support Hillary over uh, Rand. And, you know, I don't know what to say about that. It's just sort of uh, silly, uh, you know, non libertarian. I don't know. Uh, so to me, th there's not much of a. Uh, a question that Rand should be supported. And the only reason I wrote about it. Uh, 
it is big well to know whether he's lying or not. <laughs> uh, whereas I, I'm not intimate with Ran, with Ron, although I, I have a you know a, a bromance with him. I, I love him. <laughs> I wrote a book about him, uh, uh, which is my love letter to him. Uh, uh, so I, I think I know him a little bit better. I don't know that I know him well enough to know if he's lying, but I th I'd have a better shot. Because I, I, I've had dinner with him. I've met Ron many a time. I've known him for 30, 40 years. Rand, I don't know. So I'm just assuming that Rand is telling the truth and this is how he feels. <clears throat> and if he's lying and he's really a surreptitious libertarian, well, then even the better. Uh, because then, uh, you know, we'll really have liberty if he uh, if he gets through. But I'm not assuming that. I'm just assuming he, he's telling the, the God's honest truth as he sees it. And uh, what we see is what we're going to get. And, um, and now, you see, uh, Judge Mahalatano, who I'm also a friend with, um, maybe he knows Rand better. Uh, but is he just based on on what Rand is saying? I don't say he's a you know a ninety five or ninety seven percent libertarian. I give him a sixty or a seventy or something. Uh, maybe uh, Judge Napolitano Andrew uh, knows better than me, and uh, I just don't go that far in my writing. I I even said that I don't go as far as uh, uh, Andrew Napolitano, the judge, uh, but I do say that, that even as he is, he's really worthy of our respect and our our support. Yeah, that brings up another question uh, when you mentioned that if he is a real true libertarian and a true libertarian, 100 percent is an anarcho-capitalist. Uh, but, uh, you know, clo clo anything above 90 percent, I can get along with fairly well. Uh, but uh, the, the question is, if let's say he is an anarcho-capitalist. He's a true libertarian, a pristine, pure libertarian, and he he sees no rule for government. He does not want any government involvement in his life. He thinks the markets can do a better job of every single thing the government does, which I agree with 100 uh, percent. Let's say he gets in and he's president. How much power does the president really have, though? Because you mentioned if he gets in, then we'll have uh, it'll be libertarian, it'll be liberty again in our lives. Uh, I'm not so sure about that. Uh, what, what's your take on if he was president and a, an anarcho-capitalist, uh, how much real liberty or change he could affect? Uh, by the way, let me just say uh, before I answer your question, I'm a professor. I'm never supposed to answer anything directly. I have to go circuitously. Uh, even Ron is not an anarchist. Uh, Ron has certain anarcho tendencies, which are great, but uh, he's more of a constitutionalist. Uh, let's get back to uh, 1776 or whatever. Uh, so, uh, Although he did say in one interview that he thinks the idea of anarchy is, I forget the word he used, I think he said great, um, and he said, uh, I think that's wonderful. Uh, so in that sense, because, well, Sorry to ask you another question, and maybe we'll get back to the first question first, but I think this is an important question is, uh, what is an anarchist? Because uh, I, I get sort of confused sometimes too, because does it really believe, it doesn't mean that you believe, uh, that the word believe almost becomes religion, right? Uh, that uh, anarchy uh, would be the perfect way for humans to, to organize themselves? Or can you just have that as your uh, sort of your goal or your idea, or your, your move towards that sort of a thing? Well, I mean, most people, when they hear the word anarchy, they go, oh, my goodness, uh, bomb throwing, uh, beard. Well, I have a beard, but I'm not throwing. You have a beard, too. Uh, uh, a little stubble. A little stubble. I, I have more anarchist beard than you do. <laughs> uh, most people think of, uh, you know, a crazy person throwing bombs. But if there's anyone throwing bombs, it's not anarchists. It's archists. <laughs> Uh, so what does anarchy mean? Because a lot of libertarians are saying either you shouldn't support anyone because you're supporting government or what have you, or, you know, they start saying, well, Rand is not really a great libertarian because he deviated on this and he deviated on that and, and uh, he uh, changed his mind on the third thing and therefore he's no good. Well, yeah, I, I, you know, Rand is not 100% libertarian. Uh, he's uh, not his father. His father, I call the a ninety-seven percent libertarian because I, uh, I'm the hundred percent. I, I have to look at it uh, from my own, uh, you know, eyeglasses, uh, and I disagree with Ron on well two or three things, you know, uh, and I disagree with Rand on more. I think Ron is a much better libertarian than his son. I wish the apple would have fallen closer to the tree, but uh, what the heck. Uh, 
uh, he's he's very good. And and my the reason I wrote about it is because so many libertarians are down on him, and I I think it's unfair and improper. And I, I think Rand is you know pretty darn good, not excellent, but you know uh, B minus. Or I gave him a seventy on my libertarian meter. I, I might have pulled it down to a sixty, but everybody else is I don't know uh, below thirty. So uh, uh, he's pretty darn good. Yeah, it's very interesting to see all the different uh, perspectives on this and all the uproar that this has caused amongst the libertarian and anarcho-capitalist communities. There's some ANCAPs who support RAN. There's some that uh, definitely don't support him, obviously, because of his in involvement at all with government. So those, they're the sort of the more extreme, uh, which is fine with me. I have no problem with any sort of anarcho-capitalist or libertarian, for the most part, really, as long as they really do want more liberty in our lives. Uh, and uh, But uh, people have really been, there's been all sorts of perspectives as you pointed out, people going off the deep end of people who are, like you said, very well-known libertarians with a good background in libertarianism saying they they hope uh, Hillary wins. Now, actually, I mentioned this, so maybe I can kind of understand their viewpoint. Uh, I was questioning whether uh, it's good if we have a, a libertarian president at this time. And I actually mentioned this back when Ron Paul was running as well. I, I just questioned, will this help our cause or hurt it? Because the U.S. is in such dire straits at the moment. It's going down. The U.S. dollar is going to collapse. The U.S. government is bankrupt. There's no doubt about that. Uh, is there a, a, a risk that, uh, I doubt Rand Paul is going to win anyway, because we saw what they did to Ron Paul, but is there a risk that if he did win, that it could actually go against libertarianism, because he would be sitting there in the Oval Office as things really started to collapse? Well, of course there's a risk. I mean, you know, you get out of bed, it's a risk. You stay in bed, it's a risk. I mean, life is a risk. You never know for sure what's going to happen, but uh, I think that uh, any realistic assessment of uh, the situation would be that if Rand uh, Paul ran and won not only the Republican nomination, but then beat out Hillary, uh, this would be magnificent. This would be, uh, you know, just fantastic. Uh, because even though Rand never calls himself a libertarian, he calls himself a libertarian conservative or conservative libertarian or libertarian Republican or a constitutionalist libertarian or whatever. He never came out and said, I'm a libertarian, a pure libertarian. Uh, even though uh, he would uh, he would start uh, uh, pulling many troops home, not all troops home, uh, because he believes that, you know, we should get ISIS or something. But uh, right now we have, what is it? Um, I shouldn't say we. Right now the U.S. government has something like a, a thousand military bases in about 150, 160 countries. Well, you know, that's not defense, that's <laughs> offense. And I, uh, if Rand sticks to what he is uh, now saying, uh, I don't, uh, Ron would pull all the troops back. If I were president, I would pull all the troops back and have a very strong um, uh, 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 Coast Guard uh, protecting the country, which is what the Constitution says uh, we should do. Uh, Rand will not pull them all, but he'll pull 90% of the troops out or 80% or some significant number, and therefore uh, the U.S. Uh, will have much less imperialism. In terms of the Fed, uh, he will certainly uh, audit the Fed and um, uh, maybe try to get rid of the Fed after, if the audit doesn't work, whereas Ron was calling for ending it, not auditing it. Uh, so Ron is a little better, but, but who else is calling for even auditing it? Uh, he's going to get rid of all sorts of departments. He's going to reduce uh, uh, foreign aid. He's going to reduce welfare. He's going to reduce crony capitalism. Uh, I don't know that he would favor legalization of all drugs, but he even now says that we should have less penalties for it. Uh, so I, I think uh, uh, he's against a raise in the minimum wage. I wish he would, you know, come out against minimum wage. Period. But uh, at least it wouldn't rise. Whereas you know, under uh, under Hillary, it, it certainly will rise. So I, I can't see how uh, anything could be true other than if he uh, became president, uh, uh, this would be magnificent. Even now, uh, in my article, what I say is, even if he doesn't become president, the fact that he's running means that the L word, the dreaded L word, libertarian, is mentioned. Because they talk about his father, and you can't talk about Ron without mentioning libertarianism. And, and even him, uh, New York Times and the major media are all, all mentioning libertarianism. Whereas when I first got into the libertarian movement, uh, it was either left or right, Republican or Democrat, and nobody mentioned liberty or libertarianism. So this is really good. But I, I did want to get in, into one point that you made, if I might, and that is that in voting, you're supporting the state or supporting government. Look, the government is all around us. Uh, you, how did you get to work or uh, school today, uh, average person? You use the road. 
a street. Well, who owns the roads or the streets? I guarantee you, I'm going to pull out my wallet and, and, and really wow you, that I've got U.S. currency in my wallet. Look, there's a dollar bill. I, am I supporting the government by using a dollar bill? The other day, Why don't you flip it around and show the uh, pyramid with the all-seeing eye on the other side? Okay. Uh, this will <laughs> That's prove, interesting as well. <laughs> prove that I'm a sellout because I have U.S. currency in my wallet. Uh, I use the roads. I, the other day, I mailed a letter. And guess what? I used the U.S. post office. And... You know, the government is all around us. Look, uh, let me give you my, my famous or infamous uh, slavery uh, situation or a slavery uh, uh, example. So here, you, here we are. We're all slaves. And the master says, uh, you can vote for overseer goody or overseer baddie. Overseer goody will beat the crap out of you once a week. Overseer baddie will beat the crap out of you once an hour. And we all vote for overseer goody. Uh, because we don't want to beat up once an hour, <clears throat> you know, we want to beat up, not that we want to be beat up once a week, but being <laughs> beat up once a week is better than being beaten up once an hour. So we all vote for overseer goody. Now, this means we support slavery? Uh, only the New York Times would, would say that, uh, you know, uh, or, you know, crazy people would say that. They, we don't support slavery. We just want to be beaten up a little less. Look, I have another confession. When uh, when uh, Obama, my man Obama, was running against McCain, I supported Obama and I wrote about Obama. I said, why? Because I thought McCain was going to drop a nuclear bomb on people. I, I think he was that crazy. And I don't much like dropping nuclear bombs on people. I think it's, you know, a very bad thing. So I supported Obama. And yet nobody attacked me, uh, that is, within the libertarian movement. Nobody said, well, Block is a sellout. He's not really a libertarian because he supports Obama. I mean, that's crazy. Murray Rothbard missed the libertarian. If anyone has missed the libertarian, it's Murray Rothbard. He supported, I forget, was it LBJ or... Um, uh, uh, Goldwater, I, I think it was LBJ against Goldwater for similar reasons, but, but I'm not sure. But Murray was a political hound. He was always supporting this guy or that guy, whether it was governor, mayor, whatever. Why can't we, I mean, it's sort of like football or, or basketball or baseball. <laughs> you know, you root for the home team. I'm now supporting the um, the New Orleans Pelicans. Uh, they, they're fighting the San Francisco uh, basketball team. I support the, the Pelicans. Uh, does that mean I'm not a libertarian? Does every Pelican is not a libertarian? I mean, come on. Uh, so this whole idea that, that libertarians shouldn't get involved in politics and, and we shouldn't root for people and we shouldn't support people is crazy. It doesn't violate the non-aggression axiom or the non-aggression principle, which is the essence of libertarianism. So I reject all of this, uh, you know, that was supporting the government if, if we involve, you know, like some voluntarists say that, and we shouldn't support Rand Paul because Rand is besmirching libertarianism. Well, he is besmirching it a little bit, but, you know, compared to everyone else, uh, he's, he's great. Yeah, and I know down below in the comments, uh, there's going to be a lot of what you would call your more extreme anarcho-capitalists. And I'm, again, I, I'm an extreme anarcho-capitalist as well, as, although I, uh, I, I'm I very open to all kinds of ideas on how we can get to liberty, uh, which uh, probably is going to have to go one way or another through government in one way or another, uh, because they're just not going to just disappear overnight just because we're saying smart things out here. Uh, so uh, the, um, uh, the one thing I wanted to ask you was, uh, Judge Napolitano knows Ron and Rand, and uh, he says that he believes that Rand is just as libertarian as his father, but he's just uh, essentially lying, like politicians do, uh, to uh, about certain issues so that he gets uh, more of a vote so that he can actually get in. So, and uh, Rand Paul also went to the Wailing Wall in Israel, and you don't go there and, and do that unless you want to become president, because that's every single person who's ever been president, as far as I know, goes there. They, you have to have the support of whatever interests are over there uh, because they're very uh, obviously very involved in in US uh, politics and government uh, so I'm, I'm I want to ask you this question do you think it's possible that Rand is actually very very uh, libertarian uh, close to 90 hundred percent but he's just uh, massaging it so that he can get elected well this is always a possibility one would hope uh, for that but you know I'm sort of taking him on the basis of what he says I, I met the man once um, oh, let me tell you about how I met him. Uh, this uh, reflects very greatly on me, so I hope you won't mind if I brag a little. Uh, what happened was there was this gigantic libertarian meeting for Ron Paul in um, 
not Las Vegas. What's the other place in uh, Nevada, the second biggest city? Reno. Reno. And um, uh, there, I don't know, maybe two or 3,000 libertarians. But then what they had was a special thing uh, that if you wanted a special session with Ron Paul, you had to pay a thousand bucks and it was limited to maybe a hundred people out of the 3000 or so. And then if you wanted to have a special session with Rand Paul, again, limited to 50 or a hundred people, you had to pay 500. And then if you wanted a special, uh, 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 session with another person, you had to pay like a hundred bucks. And that third person was me. So it was Ron, Rand, and me, and I was honored that, that they would single me out as uh, the third place person uh, uh, to give a special seminar. Uh, so I, I met him, I shook his hand, but that's all I know about him. I don't know him that well.